Greetings, everyone, to the Go Long Podcast. Tyler Dunn here with Jay Skursky of the Buffalo News. Probably sounding a little more clear today. I mean, it was fun at Fatty for the extravaganza, but, you know, we had some echoes and some background noise and some NBA games on. So I'm very glad, Jay, that we can uh, speak here with clear voices and clear brains and try to make sense of the 2024 NFL draft. But first, you know, let's get ahead to 2025, 2026 and mock out, you know, let, let's do some mock drafts. I figure maybe some draft grades, maybe, you know, put our hand in a garbage disposal while we're at it or something, because that's <laughs> the equivalent. Um, anyways, how are you? Yeah, I'm doing well. Yeah. The, uh, the cloud of the draft is lifted. So yeah, we're able to uh, refocus here and actually look at what just happened this past weekend. Uh, we were just talking before we started recording, like, you know, now is, we're not exactly at the slow port, you know, portion of the NFL calendar, but we're getting a little closer here. You know, I think the it, it shifts it down a gear here at least a little bit. You know, we've still got rookie mini camp and OTAs and all of that before they break for training camp. But you know, the build up and the lead up to the draft is, you you know how it is. It's it's pretty intense. And and now that that's over though, you do kind of exhale just a little bit. I would say. It's it, isn't it great though. I mean, we all do it. We all spend two three months hyper analyzing who the bills or any team is interested in would they trade up for brian thomas for roma dunze would they be interested in xavier worthy i mean we spent a whole podcast talking about him and it's just like in a blink brandon bean sits down i think you asked the question like any interest in trading up nope never never gave it any consideration yeah <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Right. Exactly. Clearly didn't like worthy. It's just yeah. like they, they, they know all this. It, it could be open and shut. Instead, we all talk about this stuff for three months. Yeah. Yeah. Well, you know, you spend all this time thinking about who makes sense. Right. And I think for most, you know, the casual fan, even probably for a lot of us in the media, your, your focus is on the first round, the second round. You know, you get, by the time you get to day three, you're kind of just pulling names the board even for you know the I would say the the more hardcore fans out there right you're not recognizing a lot of those names but I and I'm guilty of this too right you get attached to prospects you get attached to players whether for me it's because I've written about them they have compelling stories I just think they'd be a good fit you know maybe I watched them in college or what I learned about them after the draft and so you know you kind of like you said, the idea of a Dunze and going up into the top 10, it sounded great. Or the idea of, of, of Xavier Worthy, how often can you say, you just drafted the fastest player in combine history, right? Well, they don't do it, right? They pass on them. They don't, they, if, if you take Brandon Bean at his word, they didn't even really sniff the top 10. They didn't even think about it at all. And so it is in yeah. some ways, like there's a letdown there and I get that. And, and I think if fans are feeling that, they're justified to feel that. I mean, is it right? I mean, should they be like, of course not. We, you, you mentioned draft grades earlier. It's one of the silliest things that we do, right? You know, how do you grade, how do you grade a, a draft when you haven't seen any of these guys put the uniform or the helmet on yet, you know? Um, but I think, I think where that comes from is everybody spends so much time reading these lists of players and, you know, NFL.com has got them and ESPN and CBS sports and, you just look at the list and say, oh, the best player available is this guy. Why didn't they take him? You know, well, it's that's not the best player available on their board. And they have scouts who make a living putting that, spending a year putting that board together. And so one of the things that I've really learned throughout this process of covering the NFL and, and covering the draft is to try to, as best I can, withdraw or with, with you know, withhold, reserve as much judgment as possible. There, I'm going to have opinions on the class, same as you, same as every fan out there. You know, those analysts that grade the draft, they're allowed to have their opinions, but that's all they are right now is opinions. And so I've really been, I've tried to be hesitant on, you know, having any hot takes at all about the draft class. We've got to give it time. Well said. And uh, just before I forget to, Jim Monas will be back on the podcast Tuesday to get into other NFL topics, Michael mm -hmm. Penix Jr. to the Falcons comes to mind. All these quarterbacks, all this offense. So if you're listening, you're wondering, uh, where's Monus? That's We'll get into all that now. And with Jay, we're going to stick to the Buffalo Bills here in Western New York. Um, and as always, fatty beer, fueling us, IPAs, seasonals, sours. Get on in, get what you need. It's a nice day out. I think this is sour weather. Nobody will judge you if you uh, have a sour while you're mowing your lawn. I certainly won't. 
because maybe that's happened from time to time here in Boston, <laughs> you, New York. You got a big lawn out there in Boston too. And uh, yeah, shout out to Fatty Beer, St. Francis alum. I got to give my plug as well to uh, to the Red Raiders there. <laughs> that's right. Nick yeah. and Chris do a hell of a job. So I think I, I want to think macro and micro with you, Jay, because we could analyze this draft in a million different ways. Macro though, like big picture, I tried to take a deep breath myself before I even wrote anything because it's that you feel that urge like on a Thursday night, I should say Friday morning, right? Brandon Bean came out to us around 1230 AM. Yeah. Uh, it, it's funny, you know, that food, that pasta uh, from all berries, it was sitting there all day. I went, I went back. I, I got another plate. It was cold, but Hey, sometimes cold pasta works. Yeah. Uh, and then he came out and he talked and there's that urge to like, want to have a take to your point, like want want to have a strong opinion because I liked worthy. Like a lot of scouts did. I see a game where receivers can run freely through the secondary. Um, I am that old man yelling at the cloud. I think it's horrifying where football's going and Roger Goodell is, you know, um, trotting kids out there in flag football and uniforms to just tell you, this is where the game is going. We're eliminating defense from the sport. Uh, we're killing it off. I mean, the top 14 players drafted were on offense. I think 23 of the 32 first round picks were offense. And I'm just looking at Xavier Worthy as a, a, an absolute weapon that Josh Allen would love. He's going to get behind mm -hmm. the defense. You've got a quarterback and throw it over the mountains, put him in that offense. And I even said this multiple times, like you don't want Kansas city getting them like the, and that, and that was in my head. Like you, you want to get this player, but you also want to prevent Kansas city from getting this player. So that's the instinct Thursday night, Friday morning, like, whoa. And it, and it might backfire. This could blow up in the bills faces. Wanted to sleep on it. Wanted to think about it. Wanted to see how the second round played out. They get Keon Coleman. And so my macro takeaway, and I wrote on this at the site is I love it in terms of the bills, not giving a flying, you know, what about the Kansas city chiefs? Mm -hmm. just calling their bluff, going up to the po poker table, not blanking, not even caring who they like, because you've got your own board. You've got your own aspirations. You've got your own goals to maybe, I don't have the exact number, but those two trade downs, they moved up substantially later in the draft to get the Cole Bishops, to get the Dwayne Carters, um, to, to, to fill some needs with promising players. I mean, I know they're defensive players. It's not exactly loading up at receiver. Uh, like, Maybe they should have done. We'll see how that plays out. But I, I get the logic. It's ballsy to to do a trade like that with the Chiefs. But the Bills, frankly, have lacked balls in this matchup. I, I think back to the, the AFC Championship game, the, the, the fourth and short punts, the punts at midfield, 13 seconds, booting it out of the end zone, lining your safeties up 30 yards off the ball, just constantly being afraid of what could happen. I, I had a coach on that team tell me, like, and Sean's mind, overtime's okay. That that's why they played the way they did. I mean, he took over that play calling and said, "All right, get to overtime. Not the worst thing in the world. Not let's win the effing game. Let's take it to them." And it's taken a lot of time. But this struck me as a weekend where the Bills wanted to be. They wanted to take action. Right? They weren't reactive. They had their plan. They had their scouts. They had their board. And they get a receiver who may be better for the Bills. We'll see how that plays out. But it's a receiver that Josh Allen wanted, clearly. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I mean, he had a say in this, as we heard. Um, I To me, I mean, am I, am I crazy to think that, that this is a, a psychological step in the right direction for a team that needs to overcome a substantial psychological hurdle that is the Kansas City Chiefs? No, not at all. And, you know, start with the Allen thing. I think rightfully he should have an opinion on that. He had an opinion last year on Dalton Kincaid. Why wouldn't you consult your quarterback on the guy that he might be throwing to more than anyone else in the receiver room, right? Soon enough. And and so him having an opinion on Keon Coleman, I think is justified. I think you, he's the most important guy in the franchise. So yeah, you want to make the guy happy. Does that mean he should be one pulling the, the card? No, not necessarily, but I think running it by him and, and it sounds like the way that they did is is completely reasonable and you know to your larger point this took some some stones from brandon bean right to make a deal with the chiefs and and we talked to him thursday night friday morning about it i i asked him specifically was there any hesitancy to make a trade with kansas city listen the last time you guys did that now you weren't in charge of the board right but it resulted them in them getting patrick mahomes 
And, you know, was there any sort of apprehension about doing, you know, doing a similar thing? He, and he kind of answered the question like, no, it's not even anything that we would have considered, you know, and, and certainly he didn't, he didn't say that, but just based on his tone, being around Brandon Bean every day for six years during the season, covering him as much as I have, based on the way that he answered it, I, I took away that that wasn't even anywhere in his mind about, hey, we, we don't want to make a trade with Kansas City because we did that before and it didn't work out. And but to your point, though, about worthy, right, we, we've got to look at that the, rightly or wrongly. And I think rightly, it is going to be connected the rest of his career. The Bills passed on him and the Bills traded him in yes. essence to the Chiefs. Yes. So if Xavier yeah. Worthy becomes very, very good, one of the things I think we probably said it on the podcast we did before the draft, for, for Xavier Worthy to have success in the NFL at 165 pounds, I thought it was a prerequisite that he goes to a really creative play caller, a good situation who best you, knows how to utilize his skills. Well, <laughs> maybe he went to the best play caller of all time, right, in, in Andy mm -hmm. Reid. Maybe he went to the best quarterback of all time in Patrick Mahomes guys that are at least in the in those conversations. And so I think it's a great situation for Worthy. Listen, if he can't succeed there, he probably can't succeed anywhere in the NFL because that that is the ideal situation for an offensive player or wide receiver to walk into. For Brandon Bean to make that trade, he said he didn't know that the Chiefs were coming up for Xavier Worthy. He didn't ask you know who they were going to draft. I believe him. I think he's a straight shooter about a lot of that stuff. He said that he's not surprised necessarily that they drafted a wide receiver. I'm sure that they had the list of needs for the Chiefs and wide receiver was on it. But Brandon Bean's name is going to be attached to this trade for the rest of his career. And the, and the comparison is going to be made between Keon Coleman and Xavier Worthy. And Brandon Bean badly needs Keon Coleman to be a better NFL player than Xavier Worthy ends up being. Would Xavier Worthy have fit here in Buffalo? I, I said it to you on the podcast. I, I wrote it in the paper. Ultimately, I'd, in, in the mock draft that I did, I didn't have the Bills taking Xavier Worthy, but I was really warming up to the idea as the draft got closer. Here's the thing, though. Right. And you, you talk about, you know, kind of separating yourself a little bit, waking up Friday morning and kind of breathing and saying, okay, let's, let's look at what they did. Well, you've, you've signed Curtis Samuel, who I believe has a skill set that is – kind of similar to Xavier Worthy. I think, I think it's wrong to look at Xavier Worthy's 40 speed, his combine, his time speed, and say, well, he's the best deep threat in the draft. There were a lot of analytics that said he might be the worst deep threat in the draft based on some of his, you know, his yards right. per attempt, his yards per reception. When they threw deep to Xavier Worthy at Texas, it didn't work out all that often. So I don't know that now, does that mean that you can't get him the ball on a bubble screen and have him take it 70 yards? Absolutely not, right? There are other ways they can use him. But I think for what the Bills' offense needed, it certainly needed an X receiver. They did not have that. Xavier Worthy wasn't going to come in and do that. That doesn't, make, that doesn't make the pick right or wrong in Keon Coleman. Keon Coleman is going to have to go out and prove over the next three to four years the length of his rookie contract that he's ultimately a better player than Xavier Worthy. And if he doesn't, Brandon Bean is going to rightfully take a lot of heat for that. I think Brandon Bean is smart enough to know that. And I think that gets back ultimately to what you're saying. This took a lot of stones to make that pick, to not only make that trade, to pass over a guy like Worthy and to say, no, we determine, and to do it at 32, mind you, right? Because yeah. who else had gone? Uh, Pearsall had gone. And then at 32, you could have taken Coleman there. Instead, you trade again with the Panthers, let them take Leggett. That's another receiver now that's going to get compared to Keon Coleman. So, and that's not even to mention the guys that go behind him in the second round, McConkey with the very next pick. You knew that the Bills needed a wide receiver in this draft. You knew that it was probably going to be at the first round, and if not, it was going to be in the second round at the latest. You knew that there was a big group of them beyond the top three who were sort of all grouped together. Worthy was in that mix. Coleman was as well. Bean has identified Coleman as being the best one of that bunch. Now he needs to be right. What, what a fascinating scene, too, as it's 1230, 1245 in the morning, and Brandon Bean is kind of articulating this all, right? I think you're right. He, he, he knows what the fan base is thinking and saying. 
and they, they want to hear something. I mean, they're dying for him to just sit there and say, all right, guys, we just pulled off a trade for Debo Samuel, T. Higgins, right? which a couple of days later, then he kind of pours cold water on that. Like, yeah, guys, that ain't coming. Nobody holds uh, your breath for all that. Well, I'm glad you said that because, uh, you know, he's wrapping up the draft Saturday night and he he's not even asked it, really. He just volunteers it. Hey, guys, if you're waiting for a trade, it ain't happening. I mean, and, you know, <laughs> You look at the financials, you know, three million bucks in cap space. Right. Like, it, it, you know, you're not going to be able to make that trade unless you do some serious salary cap gymnastics. But I mean, he got out in front of it. He he didn't even wait for the question to be asked. Where before he's saying, "Yeah, don't expect T. Higgins, don't expect Debo Samuel, don't expect Brandon Ayuk, whoever else might be on the trade block. We're not doing it. This is our plan." And you know, it's funny. Yeah. We're kind of we're kind of previewing what I'm going to be writing about for. Uh, in the Buffalo news here uh, this week. And I I don't know that in this draft, Brandon Bean delivered on what fans wanted necessarily, Mm -hmm. but he kind of did what he thought was best for the bills, which is his job. And sometimes that lines up with what fans want. And then other times, like in this instance, maybe it doesn't necessarily. I know I'm thinking, I'm thinking of Christmas vacation with Clark Griswold talking to cousin Eddie's kids. And they, you know, they're, they're, they're telling Clark, you know, Dad said Santa's not coming this year. Like Brandon's just telling the fans, Santa's yeah. not coming this year, guys. But he got Quintez Cephas. I don't, I don't know if that suffices, but you know, we picked him up at Dollar General on on the night before Christmas. If that works, well, you know, it's it's funny. I was I was listening to that to that press conference on Saturday after the draft is over, and he and he's talking about wide receiver. And and again, this goes back to what I was saying uh, at the start about not coming away with these hard and fast conclusions. This draft stinks because they didn't do this, or this draft is great because they did this. I will say, though, when I heard Brandon Bean bring up the name Tyrell Shavers, it's like, eh, I mean, are we really, like, I don't know that that we're going to go down that route. Like, that's going to be a tough sell to the fan base. That's going to be a tough sell to media, really to anyone. Like, I don't, I I think I would have pumped the brakes there. I I think I would have just said, hey, we like the group we got. We like adding Keon Coleman, but I think what I'm trying to say here is that if you're a fan and you're looking at this wide receiver group on paper right now and saying it's not good enough, I think you're justified in maybe having that conclusion. I think there's a lot that this group has to prove and that really isn't going to start until week one. I mean, they can look great in camp when the other team isn't tackling and right. you know they're playing against their own guys, but they're going to need to show up week one of the regular season and prove a lot of people wrong because I think there are a lot of people out there who are justifiably questioning whether the Bills have done enough at wide receiver for Josh Allen. Yeah, and I definitely want to get into that too. It's it's so funny. Tyrone Shavers, my mind goes to Tyrone Biggums. Like he he could have literally <laughs> said Tyrone Biggums and nobody would have probably known the difference. But like the scene there, uh Friday morning. So yeah, I mean, it, you've got Xavier Worthy's highlights running on NFL network right over his shoulder as he's explaining to everybody, we did not view him as a first round prospect. Like they, they placed like such a bet against this guy. Like we don't view him as good enough, you know, and there could be a lot that goes into it. I think we're assuming that size has a lot to do with it. Josh Allen's preference. Honestly, I wouldn't be surprised if pre draft interactions came into play. I mean, we're hearing a lot about how a guy is wired and personality and wanting, you know, strong locker room presence. Like, I, I feel like maybe at some point he could have rubbed them the wrong way. I know A.D. Mitchell sure as hell rubbed a lot of teams the wrong way, mm-hmm. regardless of what Chris Ballard said. I mean, that. So I, I get I get in the way Chris Ballard's just ripping all of the reports on A.D. Mitchell. I mean, he can he can criticize us at go long and Bob McGinn talking to anonymous scouts. But this is how the NFL viewed A.D. Mitchell. He didn't drop to 52 because anonymous scout quotes were published these teams all knew that stuff about mitchell and the inconsistencies with taking his diet diet medication for diabetes and the character and all that like so so why even have a scouting department if it's all bullshit right that's it's all bullshit so i guess you don't need a scouting department save your mercy some money there eliminate it and you're good to go indy uh but (laughs) my point being like the, right. I'm he, sorry. He lasted, go ahead, Jay. Well, it's just he lasted until 52 for a reason, right? Exactly. Totally. It's not, it's not like the media didn't not call his name 51 times in a row to start the draft. And one point that I want to make there too is, you know, it's interesting that you look at these mock drafts ahead of, and I know those are your favorite things. 
I, I think there's some value in them. I do. Oh, but they're, Jay, they're, we got to stop the podcast right there. I, I got I I to mow my lawn. <laughs> Uh, here's what I find interesting about them though, right? Let, let's just look at it through a Bills, uh, Bills lens. There's a couple of players that were connected to the Bills, I think pretty extensively during the, the pre-draft process. One being Troy Franklin, the receiver from Oregon. A lot of mock drafts had uh, Troy Franklin, Troy Franklin, not necessarily in the first round, but maybe in the second. Uh, Mel Kuyper, been doing it forever. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the godfather really of this, of, of draft coverage for ESPN. At one point, had the Bills taking TJ Tampa in the first round, a cornerback. TJ Tampa and Troy Franklin both lasted until the fourth round. The Bills passed on Franklin three times, excuse me, four times. They passed on Tampa four times, maybe five. They might they maybe even made their fourth round pick without taking him. It just goes to show that for all the good work that a lot of people do in studying the draft and preparing these lists, they're not they're never going to be a hundred percent on where some guys are going to get right. taken, right? right? And guys like Franklin, who are generally widely viewed as a first or second round, third at the absolute latest, are going to fall into the fourth. And there's reasons for it. There's things that we don't know. There's things that we don't know about A.D. Mitchell, right? And there, that's the reason that he drops to 52. The teams know him uh, because they're the ones that spend the year doing the work. They're the ones that have the scouting staffs. So while it's surprising on the, on the surface, most of the time there's a reason for it. And I, you know, Ballard can get all worked up as, as much as he wants, but right. there's a reason that AD Mitchell was available at 52. It's amazing. And, and, you know, a lot of the same people who, you know, criticize anonymous sourcing and I mean, Ballard use these words. I think I saw Jordan Schultz use these words and report like, everybody on Twitter, which Twitter isn't real life. Um, the, it's well, why are we tearing these young men down? How dare we tear these young men down? Um, meanwhile, like every prospect is a future Hall of Famer, you know, it's yeah. flowery and rosy. I mean, shit, there are too many jobs on the line. <laughs> Coaches, GMs, execs, scouts, they pour their livelihoods into this. They've got to be critical. They've yeah. they they've got to look into AD Mitchell. They've got to look into Troy Franklin. They've got to do this work. That's their job. That's why they're spending 60, 70% of their lives away from family, living out of Marriott's, because they know everybody back here in Buffalo, you know, the Bills are a religion and they in the football is a human game. Like you've got to know how a guy is wired. And this is how a lot of people saw AD Mitchell. And you mentioned Troy Franklin. I'm gonna get to a Bill's point too. But Troy Franklin and um in Bob's report, man, this is what a, th- a scout said. He's a huge risk. His combination of lack of play strength, lack of ability to play through contact, doesn't track the ball well, doesn't frame the ball well at all. That's just not a good combination of weaknesses. Even though he's electric fast and will get drafted higher than he probably should, he didn't anyways. Um, a lot of you know he had a few drops. There, there was a lot of legitimate concern, I and mean, he was the 11th rated receiver for Bob, second or third round. A.D. Mitchell, you know, we've we've gotten into all that. I, I think that the Bills, you know, they they talk to these guys in various settings, Worthy included, Keon Coleman included, and we'll we'll, we'll get to Keon Coleman's huge unknown speed, but I think he checked just about every other box for the Bills. That big one being Josh Allen likes him. Yeah. Like, and and to me, that is such a, a positive sign, too. If they're legitimately trying to build a team through J- Josh Allen's point of view, not to the Aaron Rodgers extreme, right? You're you're not going full Joe Douglas naming Aaron Rodgers, the assistant GM and signing, you know, the corpse of Randall Cobb and Mercedes Lewis and Billy Turner and <laughs> Alan Lazard to a forty four million dollar contract over four years like you don't go to that extreme, but I think Brandon Bean, you know, described it perfectly. Like, yeah, like we're going to bring these receivers to Josh, see who he's like, take it into consideration. Yeah. They did it with Don Kincaid. They did it with Keon Coleman and Josh Allen clearly prefers big receiver. He's going to take chances as a quarterback. He's going to give you that opportunity in a contested catch situation. And you're going to have a lot more of those opportunities with the Keon Coleman than maybe a 5'11", 165 pounder. So that, that that's another good sign you're seeing the team being built a little bit through what Josh Allen wants and prefers. And hell, if you wanted Stefan Diggs gone, that, that would be the final nail in that coffin. Um, yeah. But maybe not going to the Aaron Rodgers extreme, right? And, and then you just hope it carries through if you're the Buffalo Bills 
carries through to Sundays with Sean McDermott and the way a game is called and being explosive and aggressive and not wanting to be a ground and pound team. That, that's like the next step I think you'd want to see if you're a Bills fan. Yeah, the, the what you mentioned there last, the, the idea of the, of the ground and pound team, I, I understand like the concern from fans out there about are they shifting more to that? I don't know that I don't know that you can really point to anything that's happened this offseason, though, and suggest that. I mean, they signed Curtis Samuel, for, for goodness sake. I mean, he is not a ground and pound player. He's right. a guy that you're going to get in space and use him that way. And I think I think the offense is probably going to run through Dalton Kincaid sooner than later. Right. And that's not a bad thing. I don't mean that in a bad way. I mean, the, the Chiefs offense runs through Travis Kelsey, not to compare the two, but um, you, you can do that successfully if you if you have a good receiving tight end. And the Bills think that Dalton Kincaid is um, in terms of Coleman. You know, one of the one of the strengths that you've that you that you read about before the draft was on broken plays, right? On scramble drills, he's right. really good. Well, the Bills run a lot of those scramble drills, right? Josh Allen is incredible at making the first pass rusher miss and spinning out of the pocket and making plays, whether it be on the run or if the pocket is not perfect, right? And I think it makes a lot of sense that you get a guy like that who can help your quarterback. Josh Allen's never going to be con- confused with Drew Brees in terms of his accuracy. His, his, he's accurate, but is he the most pinpoint accurate quarterback? No. So it helps to have a guy that's 6'3", who can make ridiculous basketball over the rim, above the rim catches, right? And just look at Keon Coleman's, uh, his highlight films, right? To see some of those catches that he makes. The thing about, and I'm glad you mentioned it, you know, the speed, right? I I know that people are going to get hung up on that. And and I get it. It, You really, for the same reason that you get hung up on Xavier Worthy and the mind-blowing, how fast he is, that you get hung up on Keon Coleman. His straight line 40 speed was bad at the combine. There's no, there's no doubt about it. I just, I'm just here to tell you, I don't think Brandon Bean cares about that almost at all, quite frankly. I mean, there are a lot of other numbers that next gen stats uh, had on Keon Coleman. The gauntlet drill at the combine 20.36 fastest ever last two years. The fastest the last two years, the guy that he beat was uh, Puka Nakua. Like he, there, there were the slant route. He was the second or third fastest at the combine. So there's a lot of evidence that he can run, and I loved his answer. Nobody's caught me from behind. That's a great answer. Perfect, right? Because football isn't won by running 40-yard dashes. It's run uh, when things are you know, you're not perfect. There's guys trying to tackle you, and you got to get open for your quarterback who's scrambling for his life. It sounds like Keon Coleman can do that. Again, that's not to say it's a great pick or even a good pick right now. That will be determined in, in the next couple of years. But I'm here to tell you that I don't think that Brandon Bean cares – at all and that, I shouldn't say at all I don't think he cares about his 40 time and in fact I think his 40 time might have benefited the Bills because I agree that if he runs a 4 4 40 maybe he's not there in the first round for the Bills at 28 and maybe they have to maybe they do have to move up because they liked him the most outside of the top three if he ran a 4 4 40 maybe they've got a higher grade on him maybe other teams have a higher grade on him so in a weird kind of way maybe his slower 40 time actually helped the team a little bit yeah yeah, I think I think Brandon said that to us, right? Like if if Keon Coleman is running in the four fours, like he is in that Malik Neighbors range, he's a top ten. Yeah. I mean, it might be a, a little lofty, but like point, uh, you know, two tenths of a second, it can get you drafted sixth overall or thirty third overall. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I just you think you put yourself into the the seat of Brandon Bean and one of his first big moves as general manager was that Kelvin Benjamin trade. Right. Mm -hmm. And so if you're a doomsday fan, you're thinking, Oh God, here we go again, a big receiver out of Florida state. Who's just going to be a slug and get caught from behind and can't get separation and, and, and all of that. And um, I, I would say the downfall of Kelvin Benjamin and, you know, I think Matthew Fairburn wrote, on this we should bring him on at some point it was maybe a little bit of a lack of motivation or not being the pro he should have been not taking care of his body to the extreme he should have been and that's that's where you really got to do your homework before drafting a, a Keon Coleman he's he's not even 21 years old yet turns 21 in May he's ascending he's young you've he doesn't know how to be a pro yet like you've got to know he's going to come in and put in that time and put in that work and keep ascending. I mean, that's the, which way is it going to go from here? Cause at one point, Calvin Benjamin was a 1000 yard receiver. Now, you know, he wasn't exactly playing above the rim in college and he wasn't recruited by Kansas to play on their basketball team. Once upon a time and averaging 33 points per game his senior year, 
like Keon Coleman did. Uh, but I think that's all that goes into the calculation for Brandon Bean too. And and maybe that makes it a little bit more ballsy. Like, okay, we're taking a chance, another bigger receiver. I got to know that he's different than some of these other guys that have failed in the past. And, you know, you mentioned the, the next gen gauntlet drill. I mean, that's the kind of body movements that he'll be making on improvisational plays from Josh Allen. Like if you watch that gauntlet drill, it's going across the field, catching the ball, dropping it. I mean, it's, I can see it. You know, you can talk yourself into it pretty quickly. Yeah. But we, nobody knows yet. Nobody, nobody knows. knows. Nobody We're going to find out. Yeah. I mean, and there's, you know, there's other reasons to like, you know, that you hear yesterday uh, that he, that he reached out to Andre Reed on his own to want to, you know, talk about playing receiver in Buffalo and how to be, you know, how to be successful in doing that. Like, yeah. Does that, does that ultimately mean a lot? No, but I think it, it shows, Hey, you know, you were there, you know, when he came out on Saturday, I mean, the guy's, personality yeah. plus right he's got a ton of personality um and and maybe you know you wonder you know if you're watching that for the first time you think well does this guy take football seriously well i think reaching out to the best receiver in bill's history on his own to say hey what did you do to be successful here shows that the guy takes it pretty serious and i think you know again that's a it's a positive first step it's a good first sign you know he's got to put the work in he's got to get up to the get up to speed with the Bills offense. He's got to get on the same page with Josh Allen. The spring will be big for him in terms of learning the plays and then training camp, you know, in terms of building chemistry with Allen. There's going to be a lot riding on Keon Coleman, and the Bills don't have the luxury of really taking it slow with him. You know, Stefan Diggs isn't on this roster anymore. That's not to say that he's going to get targeted 150 times, but they're going to real he's in their top three right now when the for week one. I don't think there's any question based on where he was drafted the need uh, for his type of receiver on this roster. I mean, this guy is going to play and play early. You go yeah. back to last year, Dalton Kincaid, uh, Osiris Torrance plays every single snap as a rookie. That's rare in the Sean McDermott era. You know, they had, they had gone, they had not been a team that really did that with a lot of rookies. I mean, Allen played, but if you remember, Nathan Peterman won the job coming out of camp. <laughs> uh, I know, right? Tremaine Edmonds played, uh, Tredavious White played. The roster was a lot different when Tredavious White joined it than it is right now, though. There were a lot of first, second round picks who were not forced into the lineup really, really yeah. quickly. That's changing now. This team is getting younger. It's getting uh, more affordable, uh, less expensive by necessity because of the cap constraints. But along with that, and, and that's actually what I wrote about in, in today's paper, um, it, it, it might be in tomorrow's paper. It's online now, but whatever. It, but the point is, is that by necessity, Brandon Bean had the biggest draft class that he's ever had, 10 picks. They're slated right now, it looks like, to have 10 again if the compensatories fall the way that they hope they will next year. They are, they are reliant on the draft right now, and that means that in terms of financially, mm -hmm. because of their cap situation, and there then in terms – yeah, there it is, right, with, with uh, picks next year, right? Um, so that means in, in terms of financially, and then it means in terms of youth, getting younger, turning over this roster, moving away from Micah Hyde and Jordan Poyer and drafting Cole Bishop, trading Stefan Diggs, eating money and drafting Keon Coleman They're They are turning the page. Does that mean they're rebuilding? Absolutely not. But they, this is a new era. If you want to call it that of Buffalo Bills football. Let's get into that last point on Keon Coleman though, that I think is a really good sign. I guess one really good sign and then maybe one concerning sign. The, the, good, the good news, I think, is maybe Sean McDermott's changing a little bit here because, like you just said, doesn't like to play rookies and doesn't necessarily like to take that many gambles on eccentric personalities, to put it nicely. Yeah. And so you move on from Stefan Diggs, and we'll – I think it's still unsure what the calculation was, how much of it was the relationship with Josh Allen, how much of it was the relationship with Sean McDermott. I've been told it was more so the latter, like that Stefan Diggs was done with the head coach and all the, the, the demands before game day, all the little things bestowed upon him. It was too much. And I, I see the bill's point of view too. Like if this is a headache and you believe you can win without him, as you put in our podcast before the draft, you, you can understand that logic, uh, but moving on from that, I, you know, I, I was interested to see, okay, the next receiver, is it going to be the choir boy? Is it going to be the Cub Scout? Is it going to be somebody who has never swore in his life? 
Because guess what? At that position, you need a receiver who's going to step up to the line of scrimmage and want to kill the MF for in front of him. Like, mm-hmm. you got to have some of that dog, you know, pick your cliche. And I thought it was really encouraging that they went the Keon Coleman route then because what did Brandon Bean say? He's got that dog in him. And he even referenced oh, receivers come in all flavors and kind of insinuated like this guy's got some personality to him. Yeah. He's a little different. Like, g- Give me a few screws loose at that position <laughs> and, and, and then work with that player. You've yeah. got it as a head coach. You've got to be willing to build that relationship. And that maybe it was the case with Diggs to a point, but he was really close with Chad Hall. Never really close with Sean McDermott. I think that's good because in that draft room, you know, maybe Bean does have the juice in that final call. But remember, Sean McDermott was here before Brandon Bean. Sean McDermott has a lot of say in who's drafted and who isn't drafted. The fact that they were able to kind of get him over that goal line, whatever those conversations were like, um, I I think I think that that is a good sign. And now he's got to play and they don't play rookies a lot. Yeah, well, I think I think that's changing. I think it has to change. I think it by necessity or by right. evolution, right? You know, whether what, however you want to phrase that, determine that. But you know, they showed last year that they can play them and they can play well. Uh, you know, T- Torrance had a great year. Kincaid had a, a I'm going to call it a good year. I wouldn't call it a great year. Uh, so I think I, I think they can, and I do think that that shows maybe some some growing, uh, some growth from the head coach, right? Okay, we've got to do this, whether I like it or not, we're going to do it. We either we have to, or we should, because it's best for the team. Listen, they had a, they had a veteran in Ryan Bates who they signed to a pretty decent contract and they went to camp and said, Osiris Torrance is better and we're going to start him. And I know that didn't sit great with Bates. He didn't, he didn't love it. And, but tough, right? I mean, this, this guy's better and he's younger. So what we're going to play him. Yeah. One other thing that I, I think, you know, maybe shows a little bit of growth from the head coach this offseason. Look at his coordinator hires. Joe Brady and Bobby Babich are different personalities than Sean McDermott. Yes. They are, they are younger, right? They have the juice, the energy, whatever you want to, whatever cliched word you want to use to describe them. But those are the, those are the first descriptions every single player gives of those two coaches. They love the energy that they bring. They're younger, right? And I think Sean is 50, 51 now, right right in that range. Um, Brady's in his 30s. Babich, I think, is 40, 41 years old, right? So they're substantially younger coaches. I don't know when Sean McDermott came here in 2017. He he had Rick Dennison as his uh, offensive coordinator and Leslie Frazier as his defensive coordinator. And then, you know, and then it was Brian Dayball. Dayball is a little bit younger than Sean, but he's he's a coaching lifer. The guy's been around forever. These these coaches are a lot different than I think Sean McDermott maybe would have hired at the beginning of his head coaching career and him maybe delegating some more responsibilities to them. I know it's been a topic very often about who's going to call the defensive plays. My strong punch is that ultimately it will be Babbage. That hasn't been announced. I'm not reporting that, but I just think that that's the way it's going. And if that's the case, that shows – a willingness on Sean's part, I think, to to say my time is best is better served as this as the CEO type, as the overseer of these things. I'm trusting this guy who's been here with me for a long time now that he can handle this job. Now maybe I'll be wrong. Maybe maybe McDermott starts as the play caller. Maybe he gets handed over. Maybe he keeps it all year. Who knows? But I don't know that Babich three or four or five years ago would have been the the choice for defensive coordinator. I don't know if if Sean McDermott could have brought himself to trust a young guy that way. So right. if you're doing it on the coaching staff, now you're doing it with players that shows, I, I, I shows a growth. I think it shows, uh, look at how many young players on the chiefs, right? They're doing it. They're playing rookies and winning super bowls. So why shouldn't the bills be doing it? You shouldn't be afraid of playing young guys in the NFL anymore. I get the same sense, Jay, that Sean McDermott will take more of a CEO approach and it's, it's those hires. That's what gets you thinking. Younger coaches, didn't it just look like Joe Brady's having fun up there with his yeah. assistants too? It was a different scene during the, I mean, you're winning games, so you're going to be happier. Uh, but that would be such a substantial step in the right direction too for the Bills. If if Sean really is willing to take a step back, trust his assistants, people can say whatever they want. We've got all the reporting up in that series. That first wave of assistants and the culture internally, it was toxic. It was not good. And that need that needs to change. And I think that this whole staff has pretty much turned over since 2020, 2021. 
I don't have the numbers right in front of me, but a lot of different assistants. So it is a clean slate. It is an opportunity to kind of lead in a different way, not micromanage as much, not feel like you need to be sitting in the room. You remember when you're in a, you know, fourth grade and the principal comes in and he's sitting in the back and all of a sudden your fourth grade teacher feels like they got to be somebody else. Like you, you just got to trust your assistant coaches. They're right, giving the pillars, give them what you're looking for, but empower them, trust them. That wasn't the case before. Well, it's funny you use the word looks like having fun. That would not be the word that I would describe Ken, Ken Dorsey, the former offensive coordinator. Does no. it ever look like he was having? He never looked like he was having a lot of fun. And you go back to that Miami game and the meltdown that he had in the press box and just the, the temper tantrum is really the only word to, to describe it. I'd, I, I, never, I don't know if you ever wrote about that or what your opinion was on it, but I, I thought it was embarrassing, quite frankly. But anyway... Um, it was strange. It was. It was. It was strange. It, it was strange, and I, I, I heard from a lot of people. I got some pushback saying, "Oh, you know, it's competitiveness, and you want to see that out of your coach." I don't know, man. You're you're still in a workplace of, of some sort. Like, I mean, what are we doing here? Well, those those but, same people would would say that now. It's like yeah. the Diggs stuff, right? Diggs goes from leave Diggs alone, media, stop asking these dumb questions. He 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 loves it here to he gets traded. Yeah. F that guy, get him out of town. He's washed up anyways. I mean, that's just the yeah, nature was, of fanhood. He was a cancer, but I, to, to the point there though, about Dorsey and the atmosphere yeah. that he built, how fun was that? How fun was it going to work for that guy? Right. Maybe Brady puts in a different, you know, he, he has a different stamp on his offense. I mean, you hear a lot from players about how the thing that he loves uh, or that they love about Brady is that he starts every meeting saying, what do you guys want to run this week? Right. And so that, kind of collaboration with the players like what what do you think is going to work you guys have watched the film what are we doing this week and then he builds his game plan around that I think that's a really smart way to do it I do think that Ken Dorsey has always been that way I remember hearing from somebody at some point that even back to like youth basketball when he's a little kid like he would lose his mind <laughs> like yeah, he I he mean... would you know he, he the, the tantrums would start then but in Ken Dorsey's defense too you know I had somebody tell me that they'd be sitting in these meetings and Sean McDermott, his boss is just ripping Cam Newton to shreds and making him out to be the reason that they didn't win the Super Bowl. You know, MF and the league MVP, the reason a lot of people got jobs, maybe including you to an extent. And Ken Dorsey's sitting there like, yeah, Sean does know I'm sitting right here, right? Like he, he was Newton's <laughs> quarterbacks coach from 2013 to 2017, like really responsible for that right yeah. bizarre um so maybe that's kind of weighing on him so it, it does start at the top and it starts with the boss of everybody creating an atmosphere it doesn't have to be you don't have to go the mike mcdaniel route if that's not who you are i think you do have to be true to yourself um but it, it did need to change to an extent but and before i forget just on keon coleman last point like it could go great maybe he is exactly the personality he's got that hard edge that you're looking for my mind also went back to Zay Jones, you know, he was the number one receiver, totally different team, totally different time, right? I mean, Josh Allen is a rookie. So Josh Allen is a lot better now than he was then. But man, he, he told me that he would face the best cornerbacks in the NFL all year. You're talking Stefan Gilmore, Morris Claiborne, Marcus Peters, Casey Hayward, Desmond Trufant, all in their prime right after he's facing, you know, corners in the AAC <laughs> You know, he caught a ton of passes in college, but I think that the stress of those matchups and then he had that drop in Carolina week two, it, things snowballed really, really bad. I mean, we, we both lived at the hammocks. We didn't know it at the time, um, you know, the apartment complex in Orchard Park. And he would just lock himself in his room, depressed, tears. Uh, he, then he got hurt and didn't really tell anybody he was hurt and the fans are on him. I mean, when you're the number one guy and Keanu Coleman will be the number one guy, they're calm a ton of expectations and pressure on the field, off the field come with that. Yeah. And you don't really know what that's like until you get there. I know it's fun. I'm eating the Wegmans cookie and talking about the $79 Macy's jacket. It looks like that pressure might just roll right off of him. Uh, but he, he is in for quite a challenge here and, and nobody knows how he's going to react to that challenge yet. No. And the, yeah, those are really good points about the the corners that he's going to see, because that's going to be the case, right? He is going to come in, if not the number one receiver right away. And I know Bean is going to try to downplay that as much as he can, but it's, it's reality. He's going to be in the top three. He's going to play a lot there. You know, the, the difference though, it, it's significant in terms of the, not just Allen, the quarterback and where he is in his career versus where he was in 2018, but 
you know, the talent around him is better. I, you know, Samuel is a player, right? Yes. Here showed he's a player. Dalton Kincaid can play. James Cook, you know, made the Pro Bowl last year as a running back. There's a lot more talent on the roster that I think should help Coleman adjust. They're they're not going to necessarily need him to go out and make 10 catches for 100 yards or 150 yards every game. He's going to have to show at some point that he can do it, though, so defenses respect him. Um, and, and, you know, ideally that happens early. It happens early in the year that he establishes himself and like, hey, that's a guy that we've got to watch defensively. But I do think – I think they'll be able to, I said, you know, before, like he doesn't have to get the 150 targets that Diggs got. I think they're going to, they're going to spread the ball around. There's no question. Unless, unless you went up into the top 10 and got a Dunze or neighbors, you weren't going to have, I, I don't, I, I think it's too much to call Keon Coleman, the number one receiver right now. Maybe at the end of the year, it plays out that way, but I don't think this team is going to have a legitimate bona fide number one receiver. They'll have a team or they'll have a player that leads them in targets because somebody has to do it, but it very well could be Dalton Kincaid. And then beyond that, you know, how do they use these receivers? I think it becomes matchup based. It becomes week to week, the whole cliche about how it's a week to week league. Joe Brady, I think, you know, you look at his history, the full year that he was in Carolina with the 4,000 yards from scrimmage players. I think you're going to see something similar this year with the bills in that the ball is going to get spread around, whether that's by necessity or by choice, because that's how Brady wants it to be. I think that's what, I think that's what we're going to see happen. I don't think it's going to have to run through Keon Coleman week in and week out. How dare you smirch Robert Foster and Jason Kroom <laughs> and Chris Ivory and Andre Holmes. Real and Ray quick, Ray McLeod. real quick on Robert. How Foster. dare you Jay? I, I use Robert Foster as the example of how impossibly good these guys are because Robert Foster looked like he was just chiseled from granite. The dude ran like a four, three something. He could absolutely fly. He could probably dunk on a 12 foot rim and just couldn't make it in the NFL. And it's just like, how, how is like, how could like in terms of just pure athleticism, that guy just dripped athleticism and he couldn't make it in the league. And it's just crazy to, it's crazy to think of like what percentage 0.0001% of the yeah. population we're talking about that these guys can play in the league. Because if you watched Robert Foster, you'd think there's no way that guy isn't amazing at football. And I mean, obviously he was to even get to the league, but he couldn't stick. And it just tells you, boy, oh boy, are these guys really good. And what separates them? You know, what is it that makes, because there's, there's so many examples of that, like where these guys are just phenomenal athletes, but for one reason or another, they don't stick. <laughs> and then it's amazing. Then you look at Patrick Mahomes with his shirt off, right? Even, and, I mean, you even know, Allen, you know? like Yeah, they, Josh Allen. He's, he's not chiseled, you know? The best players in the sport just yeah. do not look like athletes. Yeah. Then they go out there and they do insanely spectacular athletic things. Yep. Uh, yeah, it's... It's going to be wild to see how this plays out. I mean, on offense, that's a great point on Dalton Kincaid too. And it's it's also why I, right now I'm stopping short of saying they should look, if they would have drafted three, four wide receivers, I probably would have been champion in that as look, green Bay did it worked for green Bay. Buffalo's doing with Josh Allen blow teams out, but we have seen explosive offenses with two tight ends. Like that is possible. Da yeah. Dawson Knox was hurt a lot last year, maybe with Don Kincaid. It's a little Rob Gronkowski, Aaron Hernandez situation without the other stuff <laughs> involved. Um, but that, that's why I'm eager to see how this is all deployed in a Joe Brady offense, eager to see how it's deployed with Sean McDermott, maybe turning a new leaf over in that regard too, being more aggressive, going for it. And it, the, the, the troubling trend last season was it was pretty run heavy and it it did change and it worked. The Dallas game comes to mind. Let let's let's give this all a fair shot and and see if they are willing to try to blow the brakes off of teams because I, I think you can still. I, I like Curtis Samuel a lot. We got into Keon Coleman and the defense. Even though they lost those guys, I think they upgraded. I mean, you're talking 33 year old safeties and Jordan Poyer, Micah Hyde. You had to change that up. I mean, they're not going to come out and say it. I mean, these are two players that help turn everything around, but it was time to go like it was time to, to to flip that and Von Miller's an elephant in the room paid him a lot of money hadn't given you much 
Yeah. Uh, that's looking bad right now. You're going to need a pass rush. Maybe, maybe that'd be my concern there. But defensively, I don't see them uh, being worse than last year. They can't be any worse in the playoffs. No. I mean, this is a team in elimination games that doesn't show up defensively. So uh, going younger could be a good thing. That's what Bill Polian talked about with his 06 Colts in our series uh, a month ago. Like they took chances on defense in the draft. They they challenged themselves to get better in spots. That's kind of what the Bills are doing on that side of the ball. I agree. Uh, one point I want to make on offense is in your point about the run game. And I, and I understand there the, maybe the apprehension based on the way that the season ended, you know, the, the previous year, but I would argue that we, I thought the Dallas game was a great example of Joe Brady recognizing don't fix what's not broken, right? Oh, they, yeah. Dallas can't stop it. So why would we go away from it? But I don't know that every offense coordinator would do that. I, I think there would be some out there that say, well, we got to throw it because we got Josh Allen. Joe Brady recognized that this is working. Let's not change it. I don't really think that we know what this Bills offense is. I don't think based on when Joe Brady was hired that he had realistically much of a chance to change almost anything. You're 10 weeks into the year. You're not blowing it up and putting in your own scheme, your own system. You're basically calling the play. You might be calling a different play than what Ken Dorsey was going to call, but you're for all practical purposes using about the same playbook. Now they've got an opportunity this spring to put in Joe Brady's offense and in training camp and in the preseason to really let him put his stamp on it. So I think it's way too premature to say, oh, well, based yeah. on the way they ended last year, they're moving more toward the run. I don't think we can draw that conclusion at all. Now, I will say that James Cook is pretty good and he showed that he was pretty good. And I, you know, we'll see what Ray Davis gives them as a fourth round pick, whatever. But, you know, if you want, I, I, I'm, I, I know that there's a lot of talk out there about, throwing it all over the field, but I, I get it when Sean McDermott talks about wanting to be balanced. That doesn't mean 50, 50 run pass. I do think that you want to have the, the semblance of a run game that makes defenses say, okay, well they can, we know they can at least do that. We can't ignore it completely. And so I'm, I'm never going to sit here and say, oh, well, ignore the running game, just build, just build the passing game. I just don't, I don't think that way. Maybe that's the old school in me, but Having a having a, a viable rushing attack to pair with Josh Allen, I think is how you truly come away with a great offense. I mean, listen, Kansas City runs it good with Pacheco. I don't know if people in Kansas City are saying, well, don't give it to Pacheco because we have Patrick Mahomes throwing it. I mean, you do it what, what works, right? And in that Dallas game, the run worked. And that's not to say that it's going to work for 17 games. And, and it's not to say that you want to take the ball out of Josh Allen's hands. I just want, I want, I think you want to be credible at it. And I think they showed last year that they can be credible at it. And now to your point on defense and the getting younger, well, what did the defense that was older get you? It got you a law. It got you. You can't stop Patrick Mahomes in the playoffs. You can't stop Joe Brady in the playoffs. You can't stop Mahomes the year before and Mahomes the year before that. They had reached their ceiling defensively. They had no showed basically. And does that start with the defensive coordinator or the de facto defensive coordinator and Sean McDermott? Sure. It does, but ultimately he's not the guy on the field, right? They, those guys have to make plays. You can't tell me that for an entire game, there wasn't an opportunity for Ed Oliver or Greg Rousseau or Von Miller last right. year to affect the game. They didn't do it. And yeah, now those three guys that I mentioned are still there, but yeah, they're younger at safety. They're, they've got Milano coming back. I think one of the, I think it's been criminally underreported or, or not talked about enough is Terrell Bernard not being in that game against the Chiefs, how good he was for the Bills last year and, and being without him. You've got A.J. Klein out there flailing around. I mean, that, that was a huge loss. I mean, so you add Milano and Bernard back to this defense. You get younger at safety. You know, you've got Douglas and Benford, who I think is a really rising talent. I'm not even really, really willing to write off Kyir Elam entirely yet in his career. I agree with you. I think there is some question about where the pass rush is going to come from. If they get Von Miller to, to find a fountain of youth somewhere this offseason, that would be great. I think Rousseau could, could take a step forward. I think they need him to take a step forward as, as the pass rusher, as the guy that says, you know, opposing offensive coordinators have to look at it and go, hey, we've got to stop Greg Rousseau. I don't know that any, any offensive coordinators have done that to his point in his career, but uh, you've been around him some, Tyler. I know uh, maybe not, obviously not as much as I have, but Rousseau is incredible, incredibly imposing physically. I mean, mm -hmm. you look at him out there and the guy's like a head taller than other defensive ends. I mean, he's just massive. And so it does feel to me like there is some 
some untapped potential in terms of being a dominant edge rusher. Uh, if he can get there, that would be huge for the defense. Cause I do think that's something, you know, they didn't, they didn't address it in a real meaningful way in the draft. They did. They, they took a flyer on a guy in the fifth round who, who sounds intriguing, but you know, he's a fifth rounder. So yeah, I think there, that, that could be the question defensively, but to your larger point about getting younger and how it doesn't have to be a bad thing. I've been saying that all off season. I agree with you entirely. Yeah, it's uh, and I, I get it. You got to have some balance on offense. It's good to have that run game in your back pocket, and it, it's there if you need it, when you need it. And if Dallas can't stop you, turn it into uh, Ellicottville against Climber. I don't care. <laughs> run it every time. Panama. Yeah. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I can still hear my my coach Tim Bergen. Wing right, sweep right. <laughs> uh, throw it four or five times a game. You know. I, hey, turn it into that game. I, yeah. Th- the sight of Josh Allen. Josh freaking Allen turning around and handing the ball off repeatedly in an important game just feels a little criminal to me. I feel like I get to get over, like to, to get to the playoffs, it's going to work that balance to, to get past Mahomes, to get past Burrow, Lamar, Stroud, whatever they face in the playoffs, you're gonna, you're gonna need to be explosive and drive the ball down the field, get big plays in chunks and it's it's not going to be five yards, seven yards, eight yards, two yards, four. It's going to be 18 yards, 33. You just need those big explosive plays. Um, maybe we're maybe we are in agreement. I I still feel like you you, you want to utilize the weapon that you've never had in team history, and there aren't many in the NFL. And if he throws a pick, who cares? Right? Oh, Get his yeah. run off as many plays as you can. That, sure. that, that's the name of the game to me. It's and it's hard. Like the way defenses are playing everybody, it's two deep looks. Um, I was just talking to a, a longtime wide receiver about this, and he was saying, man, it, it's he, he believes nobody's talking about it, not nearly enough anyways, on how defenses are just sitting back in two safeties more than ever. He's like, it'll be third and three, and we're seeing two deep safeties. Like, it's, it's yeah. not so I – mean, it's a concerted effort by everybody. Sean McDermott included the forced offenses to go 11, 12, 13, 14, 15 plays. Um, but you do have a quarterback who is going to challenge that. Like, yeah. he, who doesn't give it, he doesn't care. It's like, maybe, maybe, maybe it's not the Brett Favre extreme. We not knowing nickel defense early in his career, but like you got a guy who has an arm, arm strength to drive it through any kind of coverage, any kind of conditions. I want to see that to the extreme when it matters most. Well, my concern then, and I think it's it's probably the biggest one, is who is that vertical threat? Who is that guy that takes the top yeah. off of the defense? Because I don't know. You could look at it and say, well, Samuel has the speed, but he has not been used that way really throughout his NFL career. His yards per uh, reception is low. And, and so that would suggest that he's not, you know, the burner. That, that I mean, he's, he's fast, certainly, but he's not getting beyond behind the defense and catching those 40 or 50-yard passes. So that, that is a big question mark on, in my mind on this year's Bills team is who fills that role. I think that's why Franklin, you know, we talked about the draft prospects was a guy that was so connected to it because he was thought to be that vertical guy, right? Mm-hmm. I, I, I disagree with people who said that it was worthy. Again, I'll point you to some advanced numbers that say worthy was not good that way, but they didn't, they didn't leave this draft with a guy that you would say that's a vertical burner, a vertical threat, a guy that is, specifically here to take the top off the defense. I don't know that they have this have that on this roster and I think that's a legitimate question mark. It's a legitimate concern. How do they address that? You know, for as great as Allen is and he's been awesome. I mean, you know, you couldn't ask for anything more, but there were times last year where his deep ball accuracy wasn't there. He did not connect with Stefan Diggs. Sometimes it was overthrown. Sometimes it was underthrown and sometimes it was dropped uh, famously in that Kansas city game. Infamously is probably the right word. You look at digs. There were multiple opportunities down the stretch. I think to the new England game, that this, the chargers game, Oof, the England game, game before that. Yeah. He had, he had chances down the field and for one reason or the other, those two didn't connect. And, you know, to your point about big plays, why is it that Marquez Veldez Scantling is making huge plays down the field in the divisional round that Stefan Diggs isn't making? Sign him. He's on the street. Sign him, P.S. <laughs> eh, don't rule it out, right? I mean, yeah. they, they need a guy that makes those plays down the field. 
but it does start with Allen. Allen has to connect on him. Allen's deep ball accuracy, I think he would, he would probably agree with you, that wasn't where it needed to be at times last year. So uh, to your point, if that's the way that defenses are going to play, if they're going to force you to beat you underneath, I think they've got options to do that now. I think Samuel is that. I think uh, Kincaid is certainly that. They, it, it seems like they're being built to do that. And maybe, you know, that may, that might be a good question for Brandon B. I don't know how much he would tell you, but are you kind of, is, is it less of your focus now worrying about a guy that can catch it 60 yard down 60 yards down the field because defenses aren't giving that up and more the, the, the underneath beaters, the guys that get open in that way, you know, where you, is that more of a focus for you? I think that would be a justifiable, reasonable thing for him to say if he ever, you know, came clean and said it, that this is how we're building our offense. But to me, that's the biggest question, though, offensively, is what do you do to stretch defenses vertically to make them respect that threat? Yeah. I, don't know who, I don't know who answers that on this year's roster right now. We've, we've spent pretty much this entire podcast on Keon Coleman. Uh, <laughs> before, we, before we close it up, though, who's yeah. a player that the Buffalo Bills drafted uh, that intrigues you? I mean, like you said, we don't know who, who will pan yeah. out, who won't. Uh, was sure. there a, a guy that they drafted you looked into a little bit? And you said, Ooh, okay, like I, I can see this player finding a role and, and, and being a difference. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I, I liked, I liked their draft. I, I liked the, the day three picks. I'll give you two. I thought uh, Solomon, the edge rusher from Troy sounds pretty intriguing. Uh, Mark Gaughan and I have talked a lot about this. That's a player that they hadn't drafted in years past. They'd never really had that designated pass rusher. The, the guy that was on the lighter side to, you know, just, you know, just kind of be that Bryce, Bryce Hall type. Or, or Bryce Huff or Bryce Hall, uh, the Jets guy. Uh, but the, you know that the 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 designated edge rusher. You're coming in on third down with one idea, and that's to to get around the edge and get to the quarterback. And I, I know it's early in his career. You know, it's asking a lot for him to be that. But listen, the guy set the all-time sacks record at a place that Demarcus Ware went to college. Like that's pretty impressive. Like he showed that he can get around the edge and, and get to the quarterback. So I'm intrigued by Solomon. And then the center. Um, you know, the guy was like, started 44 games in a row at Georgia. You know, you read some of the, the scouting reports on him and just how did he, how did he last to the fifth round? You know, you lost Mitch Morris, you're projecting there that Connor McGovern is going to be able to seamlessly make this move from left guard to center. And, and that to me is uh, a projection. It, it is, you're, you're banking on that working out. Well, if it doesn't, I think you gave yourself an option here. I know it's a, a lot to ask of a fifth round rookie to step in and anchor an offensive line uh, for Josh Allen. And I'm not saying at all that he's going to do it week one, but I think there's some development there. Um, you know, Bishop, you know, we'll just go through, you know, Bishop is going to start in my mind week one. I think he's going to step right into the lineup. Uh, Carter, really impressed by his leadership. I mean, you're a smart guy if you're a three-time team captain at Duke, right? I think rotating in with Ed Oliver, Oliver really established himself as like a 70 to 80% of snaps guy last year. Bills really don't do that a lot on the D-line. They made an exception for Oliver based on the year that he had. But I wonder if they drop that down a little bit in the regular season now because they have a guy that they could maybe rely on a little. I think with his smarts and, and you know, his, his leadership capability, I could see him playing 30 to 40 snaps, 30 to 40% of the snaps really quick in his career as, as sort of the number two to Ed Oliver. Um, I think that's kind of a, a good rundown. And then one other yeah. just real quick – observation and this is something that i'm also going to write about look at the number of team captains they drafted and oh, the yeah. leadership you know the leadership that they lost six of their eight team captains from last year are no longer on the roster that's crazy and not that these guys are going to step in and be team captains as rookies but they've got leadership ability right and i think that they're they're developing that next way or they're hopeful that some of these guys are going to become that next wave of leaders i don't think it's any accident or any surprise that they drafted as many team captains as they did. I think there, I think there was some, some thought behind that to say, we're getting younger, but we need to have guys that we can depend on who one day will become leaders, but at least can step into a locker room and sort of quickly adapt and, and sort of, you know, you know there, it sounds like they are drafted professionals for lack of a better word, yeah. even though they were still in college. A lot of these guys seem mature beyond their years in some ways. And I liked how Brandon Bean explained the the scouting process of that all. And that you don't just draft a guy because he's a captain. You, you figure out, okay, how was he a voted captain? Was it his teammates? Was it the coaches? I mean, what went into it specifically? What is he doing to lead? Um, 
it that, that's why you have scouts, right? I know Chris Ballard really isn't into scouting departments and it's all bullshit, but I, I suppose that's why you have scouts to figure out what kind of people they are, um, good or bad. And it is a good mix, though. I, I, I think, you know, there might be people listening to this and saying, rolling their eyes, thinking, oh, here we go. Another process guy. You know, I know I don't care if he's showing up an hour early. Give me give me a dude who wants to take your soul away, whether it's a, a, a Keon Coleman and his unique personality. I like Ray Davis. I mean, that Kentucky running back. We'll, we'll see what he does. But I mean, you're running back for three different teams. And maybe that was a red flag to some other teams. Like, why are you transferring so much? But he led Temple in rushing twice, Vanderbilt once, Kentucky once. I mean, obviously his personal story is unbelievable. One of 15 kids living in homeless shelters and foster care for eight years when his parents are in prison. Unbelievable. But as a runner, um, and I shared it previously, but here's what one scout told McGinn. That bleep runs hard as shit. You know, <laughs> I'm guessing it's effort, but who really knows? He goes, he's an effing load. He's productive. And Kentucky never had offensive linemen. Never. I don't know where he goes, but every time I saw him on tape, he was making yards. Like to do that at Kentucky, you're right. Like yeah. you're you're running behind two and three stars, I'd imagine, against five stars. And to put up those numbers, five yards of carry for his career, uh impressive. I mean, he he's a, a player who probably plays right away too in some capacity. Yeah, I mean, certainly I think there's a spot for him on the game day roster as one of the three running backs. How they use him, I think, will be really interesting. I mean, I, you know, I, I shared a story that I think it was Zach Kiefer from the Athletic wrote, uh, just incredible. If you haven't read it yet, go go read it. I mean, it's required reading. I mean, this guy is, it, he is going to be a, immediately a fan favorite for good reason. What he's overcome to get to the NFL. I mean, how can you not root for a guy like that? But yeah, to to your point, there's a role for him as uh, you know. Ty Johnson did a nice enough job as the number two running back last year, but if he can beat out Ty Johnson or if they can figure out a way to sprinkle in those three running backs, I think certainly that's a guy that, you know, you look at this, we talked earlier about, you know, contributions from, from rookies. Well, we know Coleman and Bishop are going to play a lot. I think Carter can have a, a, a yeah. spot in the rotation. Davis can play as, as a third running back, maybe not as much playing time as those top three, but that's, you know, four right there. And if you can get, you know, the special teams, uh, the linebacker from Washington, I think there's a role for him on special teams. So you could be looking at, you know, 10 picks, five or six of these guys being on the field a decent amount as early as week one. And that's a that's a culture change. That's a shift from the way that this team used to do it. And you can make the case that, well, they had to for cap reasons. Maybe maybe that's the reason or maybe it's a change in their head coach saying, hey, I got to start being a little bit more reliant on these guys. Yeah, there might be some on-the-job learning and, and some training and some some growing pains that come with that. But again, I, I just point to the Chiefs and the amount of success that they had with young players winning Super Bowls. Like, it can be done, and you don't have to necessarily be afraid of it. You just took the words out of my mouth. I mean, it's, look at the Chiefs in 2022. They went through this very similar transition. I mean, they they made a run with some older players on defense. They said goodbye to a lot of those older players. And then in that draft is what I'm sure Brandon Bean thinks about from time to time and Sean McDermott because the Chiefs leapfrogged you. Speaking of trades on draft day, leapfrogged you and took Trent McDuffie, 21, one of the best pound for pound players in the NFL. We, we've got the story up Greg Casillo, West Coast scout, who had all the intel on McDuffie and was pushing for McDuffie and they make the trade. Who knows who the Bills really wanted at corner, um, but they take Kyer Elam. Right, not time to write him off completely yet, but that draft you get McDuffie, George Car Karloftis, he's at 30th overall, Brian Cook, 62, Leo Chanel, 103, uh, Joshua Williams, a corner, but then Jalen Watson in the seventh round, he becomes a starter, Isaiah Pache Pacheco on offense. Um, yeah. But yeah, I mean, th those are a ton of players, and they went through their growing pains during the regular season. They get to the playoffs that year. They win the Super Bowl. They're a year older. They win the Super Bowl the next year. Playing rookies, man. And yeah. on defense. And this defense, I don't – It's. Uh, I'm sure there's complexities to what Sean McDermott does. But I don't know. Napoleon said this. Like, with what they run, they can play younger players. I, I think it's not overwhelming. Not, not like it is maybe even on the offensive side of the ball. If they're 
running what it used to be, you know, that old well, Patriots. I mean, look, at where are you getting a lot? Young? I mean, you're getting younger at safety with Bishop, but uh, everything about him smart. says, like, that he's smart, that he played so many – he played all over the place on the Utah defense. You're not getting younger at linebacker. You've got Bernard and Milano. you got nothing to worry about there. You really don't have anything to worry about on the defensive line. I mean, yeah, you know, Carter's going to be a rotational piece, but you know, one rookie as a rotational defensive tackle is not that big of a deal. Uh, you still got Epinesa, Rousseau, Miller are going to be your top three defensive ends. You know, you've got Oliver and Daquan Jones. So you're not that much. I mean, you're younger in, in some spots, but you're younger with experience too, right? I mean, Benford is going into year three. Even Elam, if he gets into the game, is in year three. Rasul Douglas is a respected veteran. We talk about losing leadership, and you you probably know this as well, you know, with your coverage of the Packers, like, he was a really respected leader in that Green Bay locker room yeah. before he came to Buffalo. I think he's a guy that could step up to fill that leadership void that they lost with Trey White and, and Hoy, uh, Hyde and Poyer not being here anymore. So, yeah, Poyer, I think almost there. Yeah, or, like yeah, or, yeah, yeah, <laughs> exactly. So, yeah, I think, you know, at one point you, you mentioned about the Chiefs and just the uh, the drafting. The Bills took Boogie Basham over Creed Humphrey. Oh, boy. I was looking that up the other day. Two picks later, Creed Humphrey goes. So oh, I just had to bring, I, I know people are probably signing off now going, what, what is this guy doing? But yeah, that, that was a miss. That was a miss. Yeah, let it play out now. Let's, let's see. <laughs> has to be the judge of that. It, it, it kind of, I guess it, we're kind of bringing a full circle there. Like you shouldn't use um, past draft decisions in relation to the Kansas city chiefs as a deterrent for what you truly believe in the moment. Yeah. And we'll see. I mean, the Bills scouting department and Intel, Came back and Xavier worthy, not worthy of a first round pick. Uh, and Keon Coleman wasn't as well, I suppose, but you chose Coleman over worthy, gaining assets later to get those players you just rattled off. And uh, it's the totality of everything, yet we're still going to be looking at it as worthy and Keon Coleman the season beyond. It's fascinating. It makes the draft fun. It does. It does. Jay Skursky, this was a delight. Thank you so much for carving out, uh, you know, an hour and a half here, day after the draft. This was awesome. And everybody, yeah. make sure Buffalo News, buy a paper. I did today. Got it right here at your local <laughs> gas station, wherever you get them. And uh, read all of Jay's stuff there, onlinebuffalonews.com. Let's uh, do it again. I don't want to abuse my Jay Skursky privileges, but I probably will. We'll have you back soon. The phone line is always open for you, my friend. I appreciate you having me. And yeah, I'd love to do it anytime. Awesome. Thank you so much. And, and thanks everybody for listening. Thanks.